Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the latest of the uh, Logistics Executive Group podcast series. I'm your host, Kim Winter, Global CEO of Logistics Executive Group. We're kickstarting a COVID-19 series discussing current global situation, the impact on driving business forward and the future of supply chains. Today, I'm joined by Daryl Judd, Managing Director for Corporate Advisory and Mergers and Acquisitions for Logistics Executive Group for the last 20 years. Daryl, thanks for joining us. It's been a while since I've seen you. We're all locked down in various locations, so uh, good to have you on board. And let's just jump straight into it. So we're talking about COVID-19, the effect on business. Why don't you lead us off by talking to us about what you think the effects have been on remote working and uh, how that's impacting businesses across the board? Well, firstly, thank you very much, Kim. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to join you. And as you say, it's uh, interesting times for everybody. I think no one would have imagined that the vast majority of the world would be working from home and schooling be taking place and we'll all be under one roof as families again uh, two or three months back. And uh, uh, clearly, obviously, a lot of us have had to adjust to different circumstances, particularly those that work and also have families at home that uh, require schooling. And that adjustment has really taught a lot of, lot of lessons. So firstly, thank you very much for having me along today. Welcome. So um, yeah, it really has reshaped a lot of things, much like, by the way, most global uh, crises of this nature, we only have to look back in history to see some of the monumental elements of things that have happened and how we've navigated our way through those. Um, you know, the tsunamis in, in 0506 throughout Asia, uh, the Icelandic volcano that did massive disruptions to our supply chains, particularly in Europe. Um, you know, the, the, the Great Depression or Financial Depression, as we now call it, uh, the GFC of, of 09, 09 through 10. So all of those elements, um, we've had to learn to adapt. And they are coming out of that, out of those crises, um, businesses change and businesses are reshaped. And I think some of the things that we've gone through over the last few weeks with our workforce has been largely based at home. Uh, we'll also continue in our everyday businesses post-COVID-19. Good stuff. How do you think? Um, how do you think that COVID has really changed attitudes towards uh, what what a lot of companies have been forced into doing now and, uh, and working as remotely as they are? I mean, previously, a lot of uh, a lot of organisations and a lot of countries felt it was inappropriate to have uh, a lot of people working from home. Um, now, in various parts of the world, some of where we've got offices. Uh, it has is, is been absolutely essential. What do you think that real uh, impact has been? How do you think uh, attitudes have been changing? Yeah, look, there's no doubt about it that attitudes and approaches to you know, having your workforce work remotely uh, and giving them the trust and confidence to allow them to do those jobs um, from home, essentially, uh, has, has certainly changed. And it's going to have a, a lasting impact in terms of the way managers apply themselves and companies think about their, their work-life balance and having some of their staff working remotely. If you think back to this concept of remote working, I mean, we've had, we've had work from home, we've had the, uh, the flexi work hours for a lot of people, particularly working mums, for some time in the workplaces. Yet, by and large, our vast majority of workforce have always been confined to the four walls of the office. Um, and part of that has been perceived to be necessity, but a major part of it's been perceived to be that if we take our workforce away from those four walls and we place them elsewhere, then it has all sorts of negative effects on uh, things like you know, communication, interaction with their peers and colleagues, uh, my ability as a manager to manage the outcome that I've tasked that person to do uh, simply because they're not in front of me um, and I can't guide or shape or uh, direct their work. Um, well, COVID-19 has trashed that, has thrown that completely out the window because in an unprecedented time, what we found was it was not a negotiable. It wasn't a case of, well, we had a choice of having our workforce at home and we have two options when that occurs. We either shut down business altogether, not really an option, or we learn to adjust to a new work environment and we implement the tools, the leadership styles, we adopt a culture that is one of let's work our way through this. And I think the big thing that the COVID-19 remote working experience has done 
is it's allowed us to shatter those myths. It's allowed us to take away the perception that, gee, if, you know, if they're not there at the desk, then they're just lazy or they need supervision or there must be an abundance of distractions if I'm not sitting there focused in my little cubicle. Uh, that's gone. And, and COVID-19 just smashed that barrier completely. Mm. And so I think, you know, the big thing for me is I think as organisations start now to return to their workplaces, um, I think leaderships will be looking at, you know, you know, what does our future workforce look like? How can we enhance remote working? Uh, how can we maximise that as an opportunity for, for the organisation in order to gain a competitive advantage? Um, and I, I think those, those previous myths have all now been completely shattered. So without doubt, there will be a behavioural shift from our leadership down uh, that will now embrace a culture of, uh, of giving remote working an opportunity to foster in the workplace. Yeah, what, are you, what are you seeing happening around, um, you know, infrastructure, um, office sizes, talent pools, uh, those sorts of aspects of, of the talent landscape and, and business landscape? Yeah. Well, you know, I think some of the things we're all learning as we talk to our customers and our clients, our markets around the place, we're hearing different experiences of how organisations have had to adopt new practices, to upgrade their technology, um, to change the way they manage their staff, whether it's simply fostering interaction through you know, daily catch-up calls or a more enhanced method of, of communication through video conferencing. We've seen the emergence of new technology being adopted quickly. You know, Zoom always played second fiddle to Skype. It's been one of the success stories for many organisations, Microsoft Teams, which was well adopted for a lot of companies, but possibly never utilised fully in its ability to be able to have remote uh, file sharing, uh, remote video, and to be able to foster interaction between teams that aren't necessarily all in one place. And, and I think, you know, for a lot of the IT departments who, who regularly see their budgets pulled and stretched and resistance adopting this kind of technology, uh, you know, COVID-19 has broken down that for them. Um, management have had to go ahead with adopting new tools to bring new systems to play. Uh, in order to adapt to the current situation. Now, those tools and those systems will continue long after COVID has gone, and it really now becomes a management issue and leadership issue to foster the right practices to continue to get the benefit of having some of your workforce working remotely. Cool. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, what, the issue of digitisation has been massive. I mean, we've been emceeing and presenting and attending conferences in recent years where digitisation has always been a really big ticket item. You talk about the technology that's come into play with a, a lot of the video setups and the, and the data sharing and what have you uh, required during this period that we've all been going through. What about the broader digitisation? What are you seeing and what are you hearing from clients and observing around those who have tended to go down the, the journey of digitisation in general of their businesses um, pre-COVID? Um, versus those who haven't. Are there, are there any advantages that have been uh, gained by, by the digitisation journey? Yeah, look, absolutely, without doubt. Organisations that have taken time to understand what the digitisation needs are and have invested in that all across the manufacturing zone, the supply chain zone, their operations, the commercial, have benefited through a more seamless transition through this period. The fact that their systems can allow them to engage with their marketplace, to be able to interpret data, in many cases to run systems. Um, you know, the, the, if you look at manufacturing, just as an example, I know that one of your series is going to talk a little bit about manufacturing down the track. But if you look at manufacturing, you know, yes, it's very true that we need an operator to be there at the machinery, driving the machinery. Um, but beyond that, we also have maintenance teams that need physical access to our sites. We have operators that are controlling data through that. And some of those functions can now be managed more effectively. So using digitization to predict machine productivity, to understand when and how our maintenance should be done and sequence that with our shifts reduces the physical need for an operator to be uh, at that machine other than the essential worker. And so I think, you know, digitization is a, you know, a path that, the companies that have invested on will no doubt be more competitive 
than the peers that are playing catch up as we emerge from this. And I look, and I draw your attention to the to the city that we sit in. You know, the United Arab Emirates has has set a stage for digitising most of its government services. It's a long way ahead of many countries in the world that are still on that pathway. And if you think about just our own experiences here in, in, in the UAE, in terms of things like visa renewals for its, for its residents, renewing your, your, your car uh, registration, and all the elements of daily life being digitised reduce the need for the physical customer centre. And so I think, you know, governments and companies that are invested in will make that transition much more seamlessly to a more competitive environment. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's going to increase productivity um, without doubt, giving those tools back to workers who are now able to recapture time uh, that can be used for other things such as innovation uh, or simply communicating with your customers um, is much more effective than perhaps, you know, doing digital reports or, or crunching data manually. Um, so digitization is an engagement tool. It's a critical tool in business, and the companies that invest in it will be the ones that is, you know, are more competitive coming out of this. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, you know, we, we, we see a lot in the media and, of course, in, the, in our sector and in our industry, uh, we see a lot about job losses globally. Everybody's, uh, to, to some degree, every business is to some degree affected. Um, and I guess what's... I'm interested to, know, to understand is uh, a little bit more about what you would see as this current situation impacting what really are the big impacts on on effective hiring and uh, and retention of staff. And what are what are the dynamics at play here now? Because the world's been tipped upside down to a large extent across a lot of industries. And a lot of people have lost their jobs, uh, but then there's this whole issue of you know, dynamic, agile talent. What are you seeing happening here moving forward? Yeah, well, I guess you know, you're at the forefront of that of the talent with your recruitment and search elements of, of what you do in your business, Kim. So you you might even be a better commentator than me at it. But I think, look, you know, any time we go through these global crises, there is a human impact factor. Now, in, in COVID nineteen, I think it's very interesting, and I just I just I want to digress just a little bit on this. You know, we, we've certainly got a lot of human stories that have encapsulated COVID nineteen. One of the more tragic ones and one of the more the ones we, we can probably sit back and, and have a moment of silence for is just the human lives that are being affected through this. Um, you know, those that have unfortunately fall, fallen victim to, to COVID-19, the, the families that have been left behind to pick up the pieces of losing a loved one, um, and also those that have been affected from an economic perspective through either job loss or salary sacrifice or simply going through very tough times. I think there's two things I want to raise. The first point is I think one of the good news stories to come out of COVID-19, and I'm not sure if it was COVID-19 put a voice on it, but if you look at actually the positive human stories, COVID-19 was one of these events that didn't discriminate by geographic boundary or by gender or by age. It was completely agnostic in that, and I think, one of the things that that did was instill an enormous amount of fear in humans. Uh, all of us, all of us at some point in time felt an element of concern around the spread of COVID-19. Um, yet at the same time, what we saw is we saw our first line responders, our healthcare workers, our neighbours, all of a sudden starting to come back to the human element of care. And I think one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us, because of its lack of discrimination and its agnostic approach to, it, to the way it was spread is people have come together as one. More than ever, as a human nation, we no longer view people in certain boxes about how they look, what they look like, what age they are, where they come from. We, we've come back to that almost that one nation, one world uh, scenario where we do look out for our neighbours. And, and I noticed just in the very short period of time that we've been through this lockdown, the amount of people that have just called to say, hey, are you guys okay? And, uh, and is there anything we can do for you? And of course, you know, we turn on our TVs and uh, apart from the, um, the negative news on COVID-19, we're seeing the positive stories, the healthcare workers that every day don the mask and go off to work. And so for every negative story that's out there, there's a positive one. And I think as we go out, come out of this, 
organizations will embrace those positive ones. Certainly, remote working has been a subject for the millennials. It's always been considered to be a millennial issue. Um, millennials like the freedom of working from home. Management tended to restrict that a little bit. I think now we'll see remote working used as a real tool to help us retain our staff and to create pockets of innovation. And innovation is an interesting thing because two things have occurred that I found personally. Um, we're spending more time with our families. We're not doing our daily commutes anymore. So we're getting the same amount of hours, if not more, to do more of our work in an environment where we are unshackled from the four walls of our cubicle. And so we've, we're inspired a little bit more. We can search a little bit more. We can understand a little bit more. And I think that's creating pockets of innovation. Um, that if fostered, we can be used as a great tool to encourage our future workforces. And if organisations embrace that, uh, they will actually find that they will retain their staff more effectively, they will get more productivity out of them, and they'll get the benefit of this innovation. There's no doubt we've spent more time with our families here, and yet we're still working the same number of hours and being as productive. So, Daryl, what I'm hearing is um, a lot about this current situation driving and, and to some degree forcing innovation uh the old ways of doing things or ways that companies or organizations have tended to do things in the past have had to change uh, as much for survival as anything else let alone being competitive so talk to me a little bit about what else you've seen coming down the pike in terms of innovation what innovation has been driven through the type of clients and the sort of experiences that uh, you've been having over the last few weeks yeah, I had a really experience, interesting experience the other day. I was talking to two colleagues who are in the fields of uh, data technology and, and, and you know, disseminating open data amongst organisations. And in both their cases, they shared experiences with me where what they're finding is traditionally, particularly in a hierarchical authoritarian style organisation, that data and information has been largely controlled. There's been a a need to know as as you need to know it uh, type approach. And so it's very much been the lock and key. One of the things that's obviously changed with most of the workforce now working away from their, their offices is that organizations have had to open up those data pools, those pockets of information. And that's partly because, and that comes back to what we talked about earlier with management styles, you know, that, that hierarchical style tends to manage outcomes by process. So it's managing your application and how, you know, ticking off certain checkpoints in a project in order to get to the outcome, making sure it's on the right path or timeline that it was set for it, making sure that you are focused on, you know, in order to get to that outcome. But when you work in a remote environment, it's much harder to do that. And so those process pieces go out the window. And what you end up doing is managing by objective. In other words, I don't really care how you got there. I, I, don't, I don't need to know how much time you spent doing it or what you, you know, where, your, where your time was allocated. Or in fact, I don't even know, need to know what time you did it. I just need to know that we've reached the objective. I give you a task, it has a certain degree of responsibility that comes with that, and it has a certain outcome attached to it. I'm most now interested in that outcome. And the reason for that is I can't manage what you do at home and how you apply yourself. I can only manage the outcome. But to do that, I need to actually open up that, that information to you. I need to, to open up the data and make it available to you in a manner which allows you to access it easily. And so when you break that down, it's a little bit like giving a, a child a piece of paper and some crayons and putting them aside with no instructions. The child will always pick up the crayons and start drawing. It's only a matter of time. And it's a little bit like when we give people snippets of information or know-how or access to our systems, they start thinking about, well, what, what can I do with that? What are my customers asking me? How can I make that better? How can I stick an improvement step inside that that makes my life easier, my colleagues' life easier, and the customers more effectively receiving services or products through that? So people start to embrace that culture of creativity through that information sharing. And you know, one of the things that we're seeing, and certainly the people I talk to, is organizations now having to open up that data. 
and that over time will create in the pockets of innovation. You know, the old paper and crayon example I used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose that, yeah, that, that leads me to think about um, before I ended up getting locked down, uh, I was working with a, a client who had offices in Singapore and, and in Sydney um, in December and I was working in both of those offices for a global client as part of our executive coaching business. And um, the, the subject area, uh, the two-day uh, programs we were running uh, really were focusing on delegation. So if we talk about management styles, we talk about delegation. And uh, I, I guess if we reflect back now, on what's been taking place over the last two or three months since this pandemic hit us all. Um, you know, there's been, been a, from my perspective, what I'm seeing, a lot of my clients, is, is a great need now to have a great deal more trust uh, and, and delegate by necessity as opposed by option. I mean, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, to, to what degree uh, organisations and, and leadership have had to trust people uh, throughout the organisation in a much greater degree than they ever did before. Yeah, look, you, you've just hit the nail on the head. I, I absolutely agree with what you've, what you've just said, and I think we, we talked about this a bit earlier. Um, absolutely false necessity. Yeah? And, and I'm not sure that without that false necessity that the culture of that trust and empowering and being able to open up that, those information pockets, as I said earlier, would have actually occurred, or it would have taken a longer time to get there. Um, and largely, that was part of that myth. If I have my, my workers away from my office, working from home or another environment, can I trust them with the information I'm going to give them? Can I trust them to do the job on time? Can I trust them to apply themselves in a productive manner? Um, COVID-19 shattered that myth because, largely speaking, most people are dedicated to getting their tasks done. And as a manager, I have no control over how they do it if they're at home. So the only thing I'm therefore interested in is that management by outcome, as I talked about earlier, managing by objective, not by process. Yeah. And when you do that, you have to give trust. You have to empower the individual yeah. because there's no way I can manage them or control them. I might think I can, but how effective am I really in doing that? So I, I absolutely agree with you. I think a lot of it is we're going to come through this and organisations are going to say, well, actually, that wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. Those beliefs we had uh, aren't really the beliefs that are practical in our environments today. The, the uh, obstacle of technology and tools, well, we've now implemented those. So therefore, why don't we try to continue down that and see if we can't turn that into a competitive advantage for us? It allows us to have more flexible workforce. It allows us to create more pockets of innovation in our organisation. It allows us to create a more harmonious environment between that balance of work and life, which I think sometimes we forget in these kind of events remind us that just how important they are to, to families and to productivity and to keeping employees motivated. Um, and most importantly, organisations that embrace that will actually attract better talent Talent will want to be work for them because they see organisations forging forward with new styles of management that are more positive than perhaps a more hierarchical authoritarian style. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. So you talk about talent pools and the different types of influences and dynamics affecting both retaining and and uh, attracting new new talent. Are you seeing any? Um, developments that might lead to change in the way that uh, where talent is identified? Um, is, is there being a move, is, are we seeing any moves about, we're seeing a lot of uh, talent uh, being attracted across industries, are we seeing talent uh, skill sets being transitioned or is, is I mean, logistics and supply chain has been a little bit notorious, I must say, the last 20 years since the start of this business is uh, recruiting inside the V or recruiting inside the channel and not being prepared to look at candidates from outside of a particular space, whether it be retail or manufacturing or industrial or wholesale or whether it be from freight, then they're not considered to contract logistics or whatever. Um, seeing any potential changes there in what's happened to us recently? 
Yeah, I think there's two things that spring to mind that I'm seeing and that I'm fairly certain will be a continuing trend. Uh, we've always recruited for skills and experience. That that's that's a given. Um, but I think what we'll see now is the emergence of much more behaviour type interviewing, seeking the right characteristics from a person, understanding the right behaviour and the way they apply those behaviours. And I think that will be driven from the, this remote working. You know, is that the kind of behaviour we want? Do we want someone who has the potential highly motivated but working from a different patient to um, their managers? You know, they'll be for the style I just talked about. Do they have the ability to manage a virtual workforce? And if they do that, how are they going to thrive and get the best from that workforce? What style, what behaviour are they going to bring as an employee to my organisation to help me manage my future workforce that may not necessarily be in the cubicle? Um, so I think behaviour and behaviour selection is going to be much more important. It's going to be much more focused on individuals that have the ability to operate in a remote environment and to be independent from, from the cubicle, but also to lead and to manage from, from without uh, that, those four walls of the office. So that's one. And I think the second, the second thing I think is going to be um, the manner in which we, we select from cross borders. You know, we, we, it's always very expensive to relocate talent. You, you, in many cases, you're bringing a family across. Um, there's costs of moving. There's costs of helping them with schooling. Um, and so international portability of talent is a very expensive exercise in today's world. Today, with remote working and what we've just gone through and we continue to go through, as we learn more and more about getting better and better at it, our workforces could be virtually anywhere. I could be sitting in a country completely foreign to you, yet still being employed by your organisation and doing the job that you paid me to do. And so we've, we've uncoupled that need for physicality. And I think that's going to be a really great way that organisations can continue to bring new talent into the organisation, although be it in a virtual sense. Whilst you've been talking, I've been thinking about what's next. Um, a lot of organisations are being able to take benefit of the fact that uh, governments around the world are beginning to loosen up on restrictions. Um, I think just about anybody who's uh, watching today or involved in, in the logistics and supply chain industries, let alone other industries, realise how vitally important, with safety considerations, realise how important it is to get back on track and to get economies going. How long can economies last by, uh, by trying to uh, fund entire populations and industries? Um, we all know that that's going to come to an end at some point. So if we talk about the corporate advisory business here and uh, a number of your team members I know are working with clients Yes. Um, about how to kickstart, how to yep. go from a standing start where we've had no revenue for months on end, we've had to let a number of people go, lots of people maybe in some cases go out of our organisations, some yep. clients have gone, um, there's carnage everywhere, let's face it, it's, it's pretty tough. So been talking with a number of clients I know about Kickstart. Perhaps you give us a few tips on what you're seeing and what you, what you guys are coming up with, working with customers, sorting sorting out some of their problems and contributing towards how they get back up and running. What are some of the key issues that companies really need to address? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. It's a very, very good question you pose and it's, it's a nice topic. Um, you know, the advice that we're giving to customers and that we're spending time working with them on is, is really starting to plan for what post-COVID-19 looks like, specific to their business and their markets and the optimization of their business environment in order to, to meet both those two objectives. Um, and you know, the good companies today are planning for that. They have a very good handle on understanding what they believe their future market looks like. They're in constant contact with their suppliers and their marketplaces to understand what each of those limitations are going to be in a post-COVID world, whether it's production output because we've had to downsize or we have demands on our productivity uh, because our markets are suddenly booming, example, PPE equipment, uh, which is affecting the healthcare industry at the moment, um, or whether it's simply the softening of demand from, from our customer groups. 
But overwhelmingly, the good ones are now starting that planning process. In conjunction with that, they're looking at what their future workforces look like. Where do I need those skills? How quickly do I need them? Where do I need to apply my focus and energy? Where do I need to innovate in order to lead myself out of this? What are my new markets? How am I going to connect to those markets? What does my supply chain look like to, to uh, support that? And then more importantly, they're looking at how they optimize their cost base. Do I need big, if I'm going to retain a big part of my workforce from home in order to manage the safety and hygiene out elements within my workplace, do I need as bigger office? Does my office need to be configured the way it is today? Um, or can I actually put my people closer to my marketplace and use virtual tools to connect them to their customers? Um, so we do a lot of planning. We do a lot of working with organizations on those three elements, strategies to lead out with, what does my future market look like, and how do I optimize that business performance? Um, we're, one of the wonderful things we're seeing this time around is a lot of corporate support from governments and from others in terms of financing and making sure that you know, uh, businesses have got the best chance of optimizing their cost base, making sure their cash flows are protected, that they've got security of, uh, of loans so that they're not going to have too much weight on the balance sheet. Um, and so all those activities are taking place now and the good organizations are really starting to think about that long before we come out of this COVID-19 environment. Okay, thanks for that, Daryl. Uh, look, just while you've been talking uh, about kickstarting and, and leading out and into the next phase of business uh, for organisations, um, I was thinking back to when we first caught up in, in the 80s uh, in New Zealand in the aviation sector. And, uh, yeah. It's not that long ago, to be honest, but the aviation sector in particular has been hit extremely hard, yes. on the, which reason is so much asset tied up and, and so heavier uh, cost to, to run operations uh, prior COVID, let alone leading into COVID. So um, obviously aviation has been hit very hard. What do you see as, uh, as the developments coming out of, uh, out of COVID towards the aviation sector? I mean, what, what are some of the big issues that are going to be taking place across aviation? Yeah, look, aviation has been absolutely smashed. Um, and, yeah, we, we see just this week we see Virgin Australia, we see Air Mauritius, we have South African Airways on the verge of collapse. And so there's no doubt that we're going to have a, a real consolidation in that particular sector. And that's before we start talking about the potential that, you know, this new uh, these new tools we're using like Zoom may minimise our business travel, which has always been one of the, the cornerstones of profitability for many, many airlines. Um, I think, you know, the, the jury's out on whether we're going to see uh, a return to the global hubs. Clearly, we're going to see a reduction in capacity. Uh, airlines will be very smarter around where they put those capacities. They'll be much more linked to where demand is. Um, and you know, we won't be flying necessarily you know, empty aircraft around per se uh, because the cost of sustaining those routes is just too much and has too much impact on the balance sheet following a period of very, very contracted revenue uh, for them. So, so I think we're going to see a consolidation in the industry. We're already seeing a lot of airlines taking advantage of bringing forward their fleet uh, retirement for some of their older aircraft and exiting them out of the, uh, out of the, the mainline fleets today which has the impact of reducing seats. And so I think, you know, that's going to be a big change. And what that may do, and the jury's out once again, but I think what that may do is negate this trend that we've seen for the traditional paired city, um, where we can now fly 15 hours from one city directly to another. Because we'll need to feed our network, we may see the emergence back of the hub concept again and uh, in order, at least in the short term, to ensure that we're giving people as wider connectivity to global destinations whilst retaining reasonable, reasonable uh, paying passenger loads. Um, I think the other major shift will be in our airports. Uh, we saw post 9-11 that our airports became the first line of defence for security. Uh, border control became much more prevalent as we, as we ensured that we had the right security, right screening processes in place to uh, protect our passengers, to protect our customers and more importantly, to protect our destinations, our, our inbound borders and destinations. Now, at first, we all sort of jumped up and down because we were going through TSA screening and taking shoes off and uh, taking laptops out of our bag. 
But if you fast forward now, you know, just under 10 years, uh, we are much more, sorry, just in 20 years, we're much more comfortable with the type of security arrangements that are now in place at our airports and we understand them and why they exist. And biometrics has become a big part of that. Uh, so I foresee a time where we'll be using our airports as part of our frontline health screening in order to stop pandemics like this potentially spreading the way that COVID-19 is. Now, what that looks like uh, is, you know, to be uh, to be told, you know, we're seeing here in Dubai the 10-minute blood test for all outbound passengers. That appears to be working very well. I'm very certain of time and technology that will find that even further. Um, but I, I do foresee the big shift being capacity, being the reduction of capacity over the next few years until demand returns. And I also see a, uh, see a shift in the way our airports are used as our frontline defence. Okay. Good one. Well, well, thanks for your insights. Um, great to have you on board to kick off this uh, podcast uh, series. And uh, to everyone who's uh, committed their time to uh, listen to our discussion today, we, we thank you. Uh, we respect the fact that you've got plenty of other options to uh, utilise your time with, but we appreciate your involvement. Um, we're going to be bringing you a whole range of uh, interviews in, in coming weeks and months uh, from various entrepreneurs, senior executives, uh, not just on the supply chain and logistics world, but across uh, the wider business environment. Um, global markets and different trends and innovations that uh, are helping drive business forward. So uh, we do thank you. Uh, we appreciate your time again. Uh, thank you again, Daryl. To everybody, uh, please stay safe, keep a distance and uh, stay well. Thank you very much.